Good evening. Good evening. And on behalf of the NZMS Research Trust, I welcome you to this webinar on progressive MS, which I see apart from now this current topic of COVID-19 and MS, uh, progression MS I see is the hottest topic and in many ways the most important. And we've got two leading figures in this area to uh, talk to us this evening. Uh, the first is Professor Thomas Kellenchik. I'll introduce him first and leave Julia till later. Uh, Thomas is originally from Czechoslovakia, but has been established in Australia and Melbourne for many years. I think ever since I've known him, he's been there. Uh, he's head of the Clinical Outcomes Research Unit at the University of Melbourne and head of the MS Centre at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And he's been a leading figure in uh, MS research internationally for many years now, especially in his role with Helmut Butchkoeven in the International Collaboration MS Base, the huge database which has produced a substantial amount of very important work in MS management. Uh, Thomas uh, is going to talk about progression in MS, I guess in, in general terms as much as low-grade progression, but we'll hear. Thomas. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you for a very kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank um, EMS New Zealand for inviting me and you know, giving me and people living with MS and they support us uh, to interact in this forum and share perspectives and some knowledge. Um, I just double check that people can see my shared screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, you see the slideshow. So the uh, topic of this next 40 minutes is um, progression in multiple sclerosis. And uh, we'll be focusing on several aspects, mostly looking at the clinical perspectives, but also, also as Ernie alluded to, um, the um, the um, elusive uh, entity of late and a very subtle progressive uh, progression in multiple sclerosis that otherwise may, may be seemingly stable. Here, is my, here are my disclosures and I can reassure you that um, none of the content was created in uh, consultation with external parties and content is purely clinical and scientific. This is where I am based. I'm working from home today and I haven't seen the building, so hopefully it still stands after the quake. Um, I'm just joking. I heard from colleagues that everyone is safe and sound. Um, and it's a privilege for me to be part of a two fantastic teams, the core the clinical outcomes research unit and the clinical team around the MS Center at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Here is the menu for the next 40 minutes and um, these are the three aspects of progression in MS that I'd like to uh, focus on. So first let's talk about the progression as such and what defines the progression, how we assess it, how we quantify it. For a clinician, the, the, the critical role is um, to, to um, evaluate patient in, in, in consultation with the person with, with, with MS and they and, and their carers and, and their close family to, to sort of on a regular basis, an ongoing basis, assess they, how they track in their life with the disease. And uh, it is a, because MS is a chronic, importantly, treatable disease, um, that means that um, it is a task that requires a lot of repetition, a lot of consistent follow-up, and the consistency in that follow-up is important. A very important source of the information for us clinician is the history. And typically what you, the person with the MS volunteer when you walk into the room, um, uh, into the clinical office, um, is at the very, that is a very important packet of information for the clinician because that is the, the immediate experience that you're recalling and you're prioritizing as a communication, as a message to your clinician. Now, I appreciate that there is a lot of um, that message, a lot of the, the, the MS itself gets in the way, in, in a sense, in communicating that information. 
Because MS can occasionally be associated with cognitive impairments, things like uh, um, uh, 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 difficulties with recall of information, um, or, or people can become a little bit more distractible, so the attention can be more more affected. So it's not 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 always the easiest thing to sort of organize your thoughts prior to the the appointment with a clinician and sort of point out what is the most important aspects of the, 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 the disease that have traveled to you over the last previous six months. Um, and therefore, there's, it's, it's very important. I always encourage people who see me in the clinic to take notes during, during those six months. And now there are some aids to, to encourage that. There are, for example, apps on the mobile phones. There are wearable devices. So these are assisted uh, assisting technologies. And uh, you can see that I've listed them here on the list of uh, the, the the, the methods that we use to assess um, uh, the disability uh, or uh, the your worsening of disability because they do help clinician prompt a um, um, or the, uh, the patient with MS prompt uh, a clinically relevant message communicated to the doctor. Then there are more quantifiable methods and they are very important, particularly for, from the research point of view. Um, and let me intro mention a couple of them. I start with the uh, with methods that are at the moment um, used almost exclusively for clinical trials, such as uh, time twenty five foot walking test, which is a fairly self explanatory test, the nine hole pick test, or an, an SDMT single digit modality test. And many of you may have encountered these tests during your visits. Um, the importance of this test is that they do capture something that the standard neurological assessment doesn't capture that well. And that is the fine motor skill in a measurable, reproducible way, that's for the non-hole pick test, or the ability to switch attention between two parallel tasks, that is the single digit modality test. Um, this is the standard scale that um, uh, your neurologist is using or during the encounter, clinical encounter, to quantify the so-called level of disability. Um, and um, it is a scale that is a fairly coarse. There is there are a number of relatively small changes between these tips that we see here on this scale that wouldn't be necessarily represented in changing the number of the scale. And that is its major weakness that the, the step, the, the difference between the individual steps on this scale are unequal and at times may miss um, a, a subtle change uh, that uh, a person living with a miss may be aware of or, uh, or they seem to think another may have noticed, such as, for example, subtle deterioration in the ability to recall information. Um, therefore, this, this led us to think about, as a community, about um, the entity of of latent subclinical worsening of disability. And as the, the name of this um, worsening, type of worsening of disability suggests, it's something that a clinician would not necessarily see, would not necessarily observe on a clinical exam, something that a standard regular MRI would not necessarily capture, um, but that still occurs in the background. And why it is important, it's because Many people living with MS may have living under the impression that, that things are stable, things are under control, or more importantly, the clinician that looking after them lives in the impression that things are under control, whereas the person living with MS is noticing that maybe there are subtle changes, that, but they're not quite able to put their finger on what's going on. They just notice that something's not right. And it's only number of, number, a number of years later when uh, they develop um, more pronounced disability that is measurable and quantifiable, and that in hindsight then tells the clinician that there has been indeed a change in disability at the time. But unfortunately, by the time they realize this has occurred, the, 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 the boat, has, boat has sailed. It's uh, too late to reverse this disability crude. And that's why I think one of the priorities in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, the research, one of the frontiers of the research is to identify how we can detect this subtle uh, disability. And I will not focus on this, uh, this particular topic today, but there are a number of potential promising markers such as soluble biomarkers, such as volumetric assessment of MRI, uh, a clinical assessment of uh, cognitive function, and I could continue with the list, which uh, would deserve its own separate lecture.
So this is what a clinician does as part of a clinical trial to assess a confirmed, established um, worsening of disability. They, they, there are certain rules around the number of steps uh, change on the EDSS scale, one point step, one step or 0 0.1 steps, depending on where on the scale the person with the MS um, is at the time. And also the requirement of a confirmation of that observation, because this is an, uh, a method that is based on uh, a clinical exam. So therefore it is uh, subject to subjective bias. So interrater uh, variability is quite pronounced in this scale and it's important to validate the, the outcomes over uh, a certain period of time. The other um, reason for the confirmation is that relapses themselves leads to transient change in disability, which does not necessarily translate into a permanent disability. And in clinical trials, we want to eliminate this transient change. Now, this transient change is, is however, important entity because we do see it even after confirmation. And, and we've done some preliminary studies that we published in Brain in 2016, and this is a follow-up on that, that, that study. But we have looked at people who have experienced this so-called confirmed worsening of disability, so progression on EDSS uh, scale by a defined step. And we have looked at which, how many of these events have persisted over the long term, as, and we went as long as 10 years into the future um, using the registry data from this space. And here on the right-hand side, uh, you, you can see a graph um, that um, that uh, summarizes four categories based on the score. The score just summarizes uh, individual predictors of the likelihood of um, the uh, an progression event being sustained over a long period of time. And what you see here are uh, several factors that can determine that sustained progression, such as people who are older, men, uh, people with progressive disease forms, as diagnosed progressive disease forms, people with high EDSS or more pronounced change in EDSS, people who didn't have a relapse before the worsening of disability, uh, people who have more than one symptom that leads to the worsening of EDSS, uh, on, and also the dependence on a phenotype of the worsening of disability, such as having blood, blood and bladder issues or change in strength leading to the worsening of disability. These are all factors that predispose an event, a worsening event to be more sustained over time and therefore more, um, more impactful from the point of view of long-term quality of life. It is important for the trialists to understand which of the events that they record during a clinical trial are reversible and which of them are more per permanent in nature. And the reason is that from a clinical trial, we want to gain understanding of how different drugs that, we, uh, that we're testing for use in MS affect not only the short-term potentially transient change in disability, but a long-term or more sustained change in disability as well. Um, a number of these changes, as I have mentioned, do occur, the worsenings in disability do occur in the absence of a relapse. Previously, in a 20 or 30 years ago, the notion had it that almost all worsening of disability in MS occurs through relapses that is no longer for a long time that hasn't been the case. And uh, a couple of years ago, we had a very insightful uh, view of these results from the Swiss MS cohort, which show the proportion of these episodes of worsening of visibility or worsening of EDSs that occur in the presence or unrelated to a relapse. So here, the bottom of the graphs we see that the three bars stratified by different disease types, the primary progressive MS, secondary progressive MS, or a combination of clinical isolated syndrome and relapsing remitting MS. And as expected in the latter type of a disease, the larger, it's a larger proportion of uh, these uh, progression events that are associated with relapse, but still there is a significant number of uh, progression events that are not directly related to any, any particular relapse. And as one would expect in the progressive disease forms that um, uh, the uh, types of progression events that are unrelated to relapse become the dominant type of progression. It's also interesting to see how these um, different types of progression events split when uh, among people on different types of therapies or untreated. And what do you see that there is some, while well, there may be some hint of a gradient with the lowest incidence of 
uh, relapse in dependent progression events on the highest effective therapies when we compare them to people on low effective therapies or untreated that the more substantial effectiveness of these high efficacy therapies occur through inhibition of progression that occurs in the presence of relapse which is logically the nature that the mechanism of action of immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory medications in MS. So importantly, these types of uh, events are the, the, the progression independent from relapses is part of the, the MS at all stages of uh, multiple sclerosis. Well, let's concentrate more on uh, one of the two uh, recognized progressive phenotypes of MS, the secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. It is a, a somewhat elusive entity and just historically, how these how these these phenotypes were defined, they were defined through the um, uh, the the need to establish effectiveness of drugs uh, in MS in the pivotal clinical trial in mid nineteen nineties, um, recognizing that there are certain types of MS that do not respond to medications such as um, interference or uh, glatterum acetate that well. And that's when the uh, trialists have split the disease into these two phenotypes and then focused on the, the, the phenotype that is more responsive to immunotherapies. Um, the, why the uh, entity of secondary progressive MS is elusive is because there needs to be this transition that occurs, the transition from relapsing remitting to secondary progressive stage. It is not always an intuitive thing uh, to observe and definitely not an easy thing to observe in real time. Here's a study uh, with an example of a person living in MS from a small cohort in, in Germany, um, where you can see that the, it was this uh, point. So in this example, somewhere in 2005, where the patient has started experiencing symptoms that are conducive of um, uh, secondary progressive MS. But it was not until three years later when the clinician would have diagnosed the secondary progressive MS retrospectively. And this is almost always the case. We don't want to, as clinicians, un over diagnose secondary progressive MS uh, for a number of practical reasons and uh, the, also for the reason of certainty. So, diagnosis that no one likes to overcall. Um, the um, the confirmation of worsening, continued worsening of visibility uh, in the absence of relapses is of essence and takes a lot of time. We have therefore developed a set of criteria um, that are not so much intended for using clinical practice, because to be frank, there is really no rush to um, speed up the diagnosis of secondary progressive MS from the management point of view. But the uh, main purpose of this definition is for the sake of analysis of data and conduction of future trials and observational studies. If we are to enroll people into studies based on the diagnosis of confirmed secondary progressive MS, we need to have a rule that is, um, that is reproducible across, across multiple sites. And also if we want to use secondary progressive MS time at conversion to secondary progressive MS formally as a outcome of research, that is clinical trials, we need to be able to define it without doubt. So the, here is a set of rules and the set of rules revolves around the magnitude of change on the EBS scale, the minimum sustained and confirmed change over three months, the necessity of um, um, impairment of motor functions of, of uh, uh, the decreased strength in a limb, um, the absence of a relapse that leads to this change, and at least minimum EDS is step four, which is a, a step where a person with MS is no longer, typically no longer able to uh, walk without restrictions. So using this, um, the, this diagnosis, what can we do with it? Well, one, one uh, question that one may ask is, can we in any way predict or estimate who is going to develop secondary progressive MS or converse to secondary progressive MS um, and when? Well, one uh, very clear association is the association of the SPMS onset with age. Um, and here is a study uh, from 2014 from a, from a cohort in Göteborg in Sweden, uh, which used a, a, a neat statistical method with the Poisson distribution and regression analysis, which allows uh, to, to, um, to, to design this uh, um, a risk curve that represents a risk, relative risk for patients of different age and their conversion to secondary progressive MS. So there is this 
peak of the reason the peak drops off mostly because some people with time previous people have previously already converted to secondary progressive ms so those wouldn't have been wouldn't be in the pool of patients who are still potentially um, going to convert to secondary progressive ms uh, so in more detail or more specifically what can we really do at the individual level this study used the ms base cohort it was done by, by the medical student and then adam fambiaros with us um, and he, Adam has looked using this objective definition at the determinants or the predictors of imminent conversion to secondary progressive MS at multiple time points. Uh, and what Adam has shown, has found a couple of, um, a couple of um, expected associations. So for example, people with higher EDSS it's shown here would be more likely to convert in the near future to secondary progressive MS. And um, the way to look at this graph is this so-called forest plot. So what you see here is uh, the probability one is a no means no association. The uh, um, the bars and dots on the right hand side of that uh, of that line indicate that there is an increased risk of conversion to secondary progressive MS. And what is on the left hand side is associated with the decreased risk, lower risk of uh, conversion to secondary progressive MS. And the bar, those bars are error bars. They tell tell us about the ninety five percent confidence interval. So uh, how certain what is the spread of that observation in the in the analysis? With the ninety five percent confidence interval includes the uh, line that crosses the one, then we do not uh, do not consider that factor to be associate, convincingly associated with an outcome. So here we I mentioned the high AD, higher disability being associated with the uh, high likelihood of conversion to secondary progressive MS. Also, worsening of disability and rapid worsening being more uh, likely associated with conversion than the slow worsening. And on the other hand, improvement of disability being associated with low likelihood of conversion to SPMS. And uh, probably borderline result for men being slightly, maybe touch more likely than women um, uh, to, to convert to secondary progressive MS throughout their lifetime. And importantly, and this is the variable that really, the, the association that really caught our attention, the proportion of time that people spent on disease modifying therapy for multiple sclerosis was negatively associated with the risk. It mitigate, seems to be associated with the mitigation of the risk of secondary progressive MS. I will come back to that finding in a moment. So what does this suite of different association tell us for, what meaning does it have for an individual living with MS? Here is an example from the data set from the cohort that we studied. And you can see the course of the life with disease on a time scale here on the X axis. Um, and with different disability scores recorded uh, and different time points recorded, what is on the X axis is the relative hazard of this person of converting to secondary progressive MS. When I say relative, this risk relative to a reference population, which is the general population of people living with MS. And you can see that uh, the red line means a similar risk uh, comparable to the population. And you can see that around that, that value where this person's individual risk of conversion starts and then increases with age because we shown that age is associated with the risk of conversion to secondary progressive MS. And there are certain milestones at which it changes further, such as reaching, uh, experiencing three relapses in one year, reaching EDSS step six, uh, reaching 40 years of age, progressing to EDS step 6.5. This is duration of 15 years until eventually this person has converted to secondary progressive MS according to the law, uh, the law shadow criteria that presented earlier. So if we can predict it, that's all fine, but can we do something about it? Most importantly, can we prevent secondary progressive MS? Yes, we can. And that's uh, that's fantastic news. Um, this is uh, really a new piece of information that came out of two cohorts. One is the MS based registry, and one is uh, a cohort of people living in the UK uh, in Wales. Who that cohort was largely untreated because of the restrictions in the, in the access to therapy. And we have we have combined these two cohorts to explore um, the possibility of, uh, that treatments may modify the uh, the time of conversion to secondary progressive MS. What we saw that uh, what, the way to look at these curves is these are so-called hazard curves, and they tell us um, 
what is the proportion of patients uh, living with relapsing remitting MS who convert it to secondary progressive MS at any given time point. The time is here on the x-axis and the, uh, the hazard is on the y-axis. And here we have um, matched and so-called harmonized people with different treatment approaches. So here people on no treatment, for example, and compare their hazards to people on low efficacy therapies such as platinum acetate or interferon beta, which are injectable therapies, the first tier of treatments. And you can immediately see that the hazard of these people, of these people's conversion to secondary progressive MS is lower than the hazard of people with uh, no treatment. And the difference is 29%. So 29% decrease in the risk of conversion to secondary progressive MS over up to 11 years from the index time point, which is the start of therapy here. Um, uh, and the same or very similar observation was then replicated when we compared the risk of progression uh, of a conversion to secondary progressive MS in people on low efficacy therapies versus some higher efficacy therapies. And here we used fingolimod, natalizumab, and alantizumab. Again, you can see that people on high efficacy therapies are less likely to convert to secondary progressive MS, and the difference was 34%, so substantial differences. Also, the timing of the start of this therapy is important. And uh, uh, here we're using a similar approach, similar graph. We split people on uh, low efficacy therapies into those who started their treatments either early. So we, here we classified early as starting treatment before year five from their first symptom and late. So here we classify those after year five from the sunset. Again, we can see the same trend, 23% uh, difference favoring people who started their treatments, the treatments earlier, which was a difference that was then replicated when we looked at the results in people who studied high efficacy therapies that are listed before, fingolimod, alamtuzumab, natalizumab, either before versus after year five from their first symptom. So time of the treatment also, not only the power of the treatment, the strength of the treatment matters, but also time of the treatment matters. So if we can, that's great. We can do something about the future. We can delay the onset of this disease, the disease stage. And why it is important to delay this, that the treatments that we use in relapsing stages of the disease uh, become much less effective once people have converted to the secondary progressive disease phenotype. Uh, it is, a, from the treat, treatment point of view, it is a frustrating uh, stage of the disease because it's hard to um, further control the accrual of the disability. So that's where one of our focuses now is for size on the, the, the restricting or limiting the rate of progression of disability in secondary progressive MS. And lately, over the last three years, we had some emerging good news. There were some initial preparations, which are based on the same principles as the, as the drugs that are used for treatment of relapse and remitting MS but which have now evidence for slowing down of progression of visibility, even in secondary progressive MS. And here is one drug that is registered in this indication in Australia, which is called Siponimod. Uh, it's, an, it's a drug that is similar to Fingolimod. This is a result of the EXPAND trial. And what we see here are hazard, uh, again, hazard curves, which tell us how likely patient, people with MS enrolled in this trial were to uh, reach confirmed progression of disability where uh, if they were randomized to either placebo in red or to siponimod in blue here. And the difference here is uh, obvious 26% relative difference in the risk. Importantly, when this cohort is then subdivided into those who had relapses during the two years preceding enrollment in this trial, and those did not have the relapses during the two years uh, preceding the trial, we saw something really interesting. Um, we're looking at another forest plot here and the way to read it is the same as the forest plot that I explained when I, we were talking about the prediction of secondary progressive MS. So there's the, the, the dot here at the top told, uh, shows what the overall result of the trial was. Uh, the the symphony mode was superior to placebo in preventing uh, progression of disability. Now here in the cohort split by the previous um, occurrence of relapses, we only had evidence for those people who had relapses during two years preceding the enrollment in the trial, but not in those people who did not have any relapses associated with their secondary progressive MS for superiority of fingolimod. 
uh, Siponimo. And that is potentially an important finding because the tells us about, uh, probably suggests something about targeting of treatment in this, uh, in, at this stage of the disease. Uh, there is, uh, over the last decade, there has been a review of how we look at progressive uh, uh, types of MS and how we classify it. Um, we now say that there are, the progressive MS is basically almost one entity with two subdivisions. One is starting from the beginning with the progression, so-called primary progressive disease, and I'll come back to it in a, in a moment, and the secondary progressive disease that is preceded by the relapsing remitting stage which is the type of the disease that we're talking about now. And each of these two types of disease has two subtypes. One is so-called active and the other one is so-called inactive progressive disease. So the active, so the term active refers to the fact that there is evidence of focal and episodic inflammation in the brain or the spinal cord, either presenting with a relapse or with um, lesions, active lesions on the brain and, or spinal cord scan. So can we take this evidence as potential treatable target in those with secondary progressive disease and then target therapies to those people who are more likely to respond? The answer is yes. Uh, this is a study in which we have looked at the, um, at a cohort of people for, with secondary progressive MS from MS base, looking at the um, probability as an outcome, a probability of reaching EDS step six, seven, um, so the graphs that we're looking at, again, are hazard curves and the y-axis uh, shows the proportion of patients who have reached, uh, uh, as, as they reach the EDS, EDSS step seven. Um, the step seven is the, the, the need for use of a wheelchair. Um, we first look on the graph on the right-hand side. There are three groups of people and they are stratified by the amount of time that they have spent on disease-modifying therapies after their conversion to secondary progressive MS. So they're split into 90% or above, 50 to 90% of time, and less than 50% of time on disease-modifying therapies. And uh, what we the, the analysis showed that there was really no um, clinically meaningful difference in the risk of uh, needing a wheelchair in the future in those people who did not have any relapses superimposed on the, on top of their secondary progressive MS. However, in those with uh, secondary progressive MS with superimposed relapses, there was a clear distinction. And those who stayed on therapy for a longer period of time, 90% of time or longer, had a clear advantage in terms of a slower rate of progression to the stage when they needed to use a wheelchair. So this proves the point that there, the uh, episodic inflammation can be used, can serve as a potential treatable target. Now, primary progressive MS is uh, a similar entity and similar to secondary progressive MS is not easy to diagnose. It's start typically diagnosed with delay. However, here the delay is much more detrimental because where in secondary progressive MS, the delay in the diagnosis does not negatively affect a, a patient's access to disease modifying therapy, of course, here, the, the delay in time that a person realizes that something's not wrong and they're having symptoms, the symptoms are neurological, and for their GP to refer them to a neurologist and for the neurologist to think about pro primary progressive MS and uh, uh, request the appropriate investigations, all that delay sums up and leads to a potential delayed management. Until recently, it was not so relevant because we didn't have um, many therapies available for treatment of primary progressive MS, but this is changing now. So that is uh, also enhanced by the fact that I mentioned uh, the, the, the first point here in the diagnostic criteria, which require one year of disability progression. So you can see that, the, that there is this talk about a time lag that is ingrained into this definition. Progress is faster. Is it um, people who um, have primary progressive MS or people with secondary progressive MS? It's not an easy question to answer. It may seem uh, that um, people with prog primary progressive MS progress faster during their progressive stage. So here, the white uh, markers stand represent people that are separated. These are disability scores separated by age groups. Um, age is on the x-axis. Uh, so here, it may seem that the primary progressive MS during the progressive stage progresses faster because the primary progressive stage starts here at the start of the white mar blue markers, whereas the secondary progressive stage 
for the red market starts much later, it starts around this time here between the age uh, 50 or 60. Um, but we have to bear in mind also that people with secondary progressive MS, by the time they reach their secondary progress, progressive MS, they have already accumulated some disability through the relapse and remitting stage, which is the left-hand side here in the red markers. So there is already some accrual of disability that then continues through during the secondary progressive MS. So while the absolute slope of those disability curves may be slightly steeper in primary progressive MS, the final result is that as people reach their age 50 or 60 and, and progressive disease forms, they tend to, the, the, the rate of progression, the rate of disability seems to be very similar in primary and secondary progressive MS. So how about the treatability of the primary progressive MS? Um, here are some disappointing results. We were hoping that we will, by analyzing uh, the, the uh, MS base cohort, we will be able to decipher and identify some signal in the overall effect, effectiveness of this modifying therapy in terms of slowing the progression of disability or reaching the stage where people need uh, to use a wheelchair. So there was no difference here in a, um, a um, complex statistical analysis that accounts for a number of confounders of the outcome uh, uh, that would suggest that people who are treated would have the benefit of people who are untreated during their primary progressive disease. So that was disappointment, but we didn't stop there. And we went to explore the same concept as we did in the secondary progressive MS. We looked at the rates of disability accrual. And what we see here is again a, a hazard curve. You can see the cumulative hazard progression on the y-axis. And what these curves tell us is the most likely number of disability worsening events uh, at different times of uh, disease duration, meaning time from the disease onset. Um, and, uh, we see a split of this curve into two. People with PPMS, uh, that is the uh, inactive primary progressive MS, and PRMS, which is the active primary progressive MS. And you can see that the active primary pro uh, group of people with primary progressive MS with activity seems to progress at a slower rate, which was a bit of a surprise. So we then went to explore the effectiveness of therapy in these two subtypes of primary progressive MS. And we saw that while in inactive primary progressive MS, the exposure to disease modifying therapies didn't make any difference in, the, in terms of their risk of disability accrual. In people with active primary progressive MS, we can see that for every 10% more time that people spend on therapy, there is a 3% decrease in the risk of progression. So if someone hypothetically spent 100% of their time living with primary progressive, active primary progressive MS on a disease modifying therapy, and we compare the outcome to someone who spent 0% of that time on disease modifying therapy, the diff overall difference between these two people in the risk of disability accrual will, will be 30%, and that is clinically meaningful. Mentioned that the scenario around access to these modifying therapies is changing now, and uh, uh, let me just expand on that a little bit. So there's a little bit of a historical view. This is so-called Olympus trial, and Olympus trial explored the use of rituximab, which is a B cell depleting therapy. B cell is a cell in the, uh, that is part of our immune system that is responsible for um, uh, for making antibodies. So this therapy eliminates antibodies. Um, and in um, a trial, a randomized trial comparing rituximab to placebo, overall result of the trial was negative, didn't identify any difference in the rate of progression. However, a subgroup analysis of the trial in only 72 people who were aged less than 51 years and who had activity on the MRI before they enrolled in the trial, there was a clear difference in the risk of disability progression, a 67% a difference in that risk. And that trial led to a newer, more modern trial, which was reported four years ago of ocrelizumab, another B cell depleting therapy, uh, which then focused on this target group, people up to age 55, and uh, had 27% of the enrolled population with activity on their MRIs before enrollment in the trial. And this uh, study demonstrated the effect of vacalizumab, relatively small but sustained, of 25% difference in the risk of confirmed disability worsening. So B-cell therapy seems to work 
in a subgroup of people. And again, we're coming to that probably the same point. And here was a sub analysis of this trial and th th that showed that the best responders to ocrelizumab were those people who had uh, activity on their MRIs, whereas people who didn't have any activity or relapses in their history of primary progressive disease tended not to derive any benefit from exposure to ocrelizumab. So that is the fine tuning of therapy, of course, very important from the point of view of safety. And we want to, if we are introducing therapies that are potentially inducing risks and every therapy is associated with the risk, there is no free lunch, unfortunately. Um, then we need to make sure that we target those therapies to those people who are most likely to benefit from those. So we don't expose uh, people to risk unnecessarily, which is particularly relevant nowadays at the age of COVID and vaccinations. Here I'm alluding to the next frontier, and I wish I had another hour to, to speak about this really exciting topic, but also I should probably have, even more, I wish I was in the audience listening to someone more uh, educated in uh, this area. There are a number of fantastic researchers in New Zealand and Australia who are focusing on this topic of remyelination and neuronal repair. And uh, obviously when we think about progressive and, and MS forms, this is one of the key focus areas for us to be able to develop treatments that reverse uh, the damage to the central nervous system that has already occurred. There are a number of can candidate molecules, many of them in laboratory research, a small number in phase one trials, uh, we did our early drug development, early translational trials. There was a molecule a couple of years ago called Antilingo, which uh, acts on the uh, a break um, of the cell division on the cells that are responsible for forming the myelin sheets that encapsulate the, the axons of the neurons. That therapy, uh, well, the results of the, the, the clinical trials of the therapy were somewhat underwhelming, underwhelming unfortunately, even though the, the results were not completely negative. And there's certainly, uh, uh, there are ways forward. We just need to, and there, there is a lot of promising signals now for molecules and pathways that we may be able to modify, or modulate in order to allow the regeneration in the central nervous system. Importantly, uh, the MS societies in this corner of the world are very strongly involved in these developments, uh, and there is a large international consortium that we will hear about more in, in, in a few minutes called International Progressive MS Alliance that is focus, focusing entirely on the treatment of, or prevention of disability worsening in progressive MS and also potential reversal of that disability. And that is, a, it is a consortium of um, uh, patient societies of uh, scientists and of industry with lots of power and access to fanta some fantastic data and some really innovative uh, laboratory-based methodologies. So in summary, um, uh, progressive MS form remain, continues to be a, um, a frustrating uh, type of MS for both people living with MS as well as for their physicians. Uh, there are a number of tools to diagnose uh, worsening of disability in both progressive MS form, but also in relapsing MS. But the, the, there is still an unmet need of um, diagnosing so-called latent or subclinical forms of disease, disability worsening in order to act fast enough in terms of treatment before people develop uh, potentially irreversible disability. Um, there are signals in the uh, cause of progressive MS that um, suggest to the clinician that a, there is a treatable component of a progression that would particularly well respond to immunotherapy. And this signal, this indication of the signals uh, include uh, evidence of episodic localized inflammation on the brain and spinal cord scans, as well as relapses. Um, and importantly, the, probably the single most important instrument that we have at the moment, um, apart from avoidance of, um, of um, um, exacerbating lifestyle factors such as high BMI or smoking, is timely uh, start of therapy and start of therapy that is, sufficient, uh, that is sufficiently active to delay onset of uh, secondary progressive MS in those uh, with relapse and remitting multiple sclerosis. I would like to acknowledge uh, a, a large group of people who I have a great privilege and honor to work with, whether at Royal Melbourne Hospital, University of Melbourne and other institutions, other registries around the world. And also I'd like to thank uh, um, the um, sponsors and funders and supporters 
of our research and our clinical activities. And above all, I would like to acknowledge and thank people living with multiple sclerosis who relentlessly support the research activities and initiatives and are always prepared to volunteer their time and efforts to help us um, shed more light on this um, treatable disease, which I hope one day will become curable. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, great comprehensive review. Very uh, complex topic, as people will have noted. Uh, you negotiated your way through that very well, I thought. Uh, I, I think people, it's important to note that last point on your slide was perhaps the most important one, your work with MS Base, showing really for the first time that we actually can potentially have some effect on, on uh, later progressive MS using standard MS therapies if we start them early. Uh, people will no doubt have questions. I think, Amanda, are you um, monitoring questions? Hi, Annie. Yes, I am. Um, uh, we've got two questions so far. Um, we will leave the questions to the end if that's okay, and then I think yes. we can ask them as a panel. Very good. Yep. So we'll move on to the uh, next talk which is being given by Dr. Julia Morahan, uh, who's, uh, here she is, uh, is, is an Australian, full, fully an Australian, but worked, uh, did postgraduate work in Oxford in research and MS, and has a really important role in Australia, I think, as head of MS Research Australia. And I've been very impressed by how much active research that body is able to fund. It's very impressive and a bit of a lesson to the NZMS Research Trust, which is trailing somewhat behind. Um, and that body has been deeply involved with uh, the setting up of the International Progressive MS Alliance, which is, is a reflection of the fact that everyone sees that doing something more active about progressive MS, low grade progression is critical. And uh, I think some progress is being made and Julia is going to tell us about it. Julia. Thank you so much, Annie. All right, I'm just going to share my screen. And hopefully that's all nice. So, yes, yeah, so thank you for having me here today to talk about um, our role in the International Progressive MS Alliance, which is really um, a bit of a unique um, and very effective global initiative that we're part of. And as Ernie said, I'm involved as my role as head of research at MS Australia. So um, as Thomas alluded to, um, the beginning of the International Progressive MS Alliance was really based on the recognition at a global level that people living with progressive forms of MS had been somewhat left behind. So we were in a position where we had um, a number of um, effective treatments for people that had relapsing forms of MS, but at the time we really had no MS medications that were available for the progressive forms. And more than that, we really didn't have a good handle on really what progression was at a molecular level, and we certainly didn't know um, how to reverse it. So the International Progressive MS Alliance was for, founded in 2014, and it was founded at an international level with a fairly unique collaborative approach because everybody understood really worldwide that this was something that we all needed to be involved in, but it was also somewhere where we needed to make fast progress. So we wanted to reduce duplication and accelerate outcomes for people living with this disease and try and make up for lost time. So who is involved? Um, so I think I love the Alliance because really it has people living with progressive MS at the centre of everything that they do. We have people living with the disease across all of our steering committees, across all of our boards, um, their advisors in literally all of the activities, and they really are at the forefront of this alliance. 
It also involves MS organisations such as MS Australia and a number of others, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, it brought together scientists, neurologists and researchers, so people that were interested in MS, people that were interested in progression, but also pulled in a lot of people that were interested in other things that might be relevant to progressive MS, like neurodegeneration, um, to try and learn from other fields, and uniquely industry members, by which I mean the pharmaceutical companies. So we brought them in um, at the very beginning of the process because it didn't matter how much science we were going to do or how much progress we could make if we couldn't turn it into a treatment for people living with the disease, really it wasn't the, um, it was an output rather than an outcome for people living with the, dis with the disease. So we've had an industry forum that sits alongside all of the activities at the same time as the scientists, the organisations and the people living with the disease. So this is um, the list of the current managing members of the International Progressive Alliance, and you can see MS Research Australia, soon to be MS Australia, um, is one of them, but also um, the UK, the US, Canada, Italy, and the MS International Federation, which is a, a group that catches a lot of the other um, MS organisations around the world. Um, and in order to be a managing member, you have to contribute at least 675,000 euros over three years. And we also contribute scientific expertise in order to make sure that the activities are running smoothly. So it's a big investment for us, um, but it was just seen um, by MS Australia to be such an important topic that we really just wanted to be involved and we wanted to be involved in a um, strategic and pivotal way. There are also a range of other um, organisations that are part of the discussions that we have around activities. And you can see that we've scooped in quite a lot of the other European MS organisations there, plus Brazil um, and a few others. And so we really do have um, a proper international focus. And finally, just because I just think it's so key to what we do, these are the pharmaceutical companies that work alongside us in the International Progressive Alliance. So most of these, if not all of these, have a presence in the MS market. So Biogen, um, Serono, Roche, Novartis and Sanofi. Um, and I really think it's a bit of a unique feature, as I've said, um, and they have been invaluable in helping us get to the point where we can actually uh, change the treatment landscape for people with progressive MS. And that's important because you'll see here what we want to achieve. And often I think these statements, vision statements and mission statements can be a little bit lofty and not really connected potentially to the people on the ground. Um, the vision obviously to end MS progression is just incredibly straightforward, but you can see in the mission, and this is why I wanted to put it up, is was literally to accelerate the development of effective treatments for people. Um, it wasn't all of these other tiny other things, even though we have to do lots of activities to get there. The mission was to try and fix the absolute lack of treatments that we had for progressive MS at the time. And while we were doing that, improved the quality of life for people who were currently living with progressive disease. And you'll see that we've moved um, a long way forward um, over the time since 2014. And Thomas mentioned in his talk a number of medications that are now available for um, different forms of progressive MS that really were um, part of this global effort. And so the way that we really want to do that is um, by fueling research breakthroughs. And um, given where we were in 2014, they really were proper breakthroughs. So it wasn't hyperbole. We needed to change the way we were going about progressive MS. So we have three priorities um, and Thomas has kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, I'm going to talk about the priorities and then I'm going to talk about the different activities that we do in each of these spaces. The first one is to understand, prevent and reverse progression. And I've already said that actually even still at a molecular level, I don't think we understand progression um, particularly well, certainly not as well as we understand the immunological component of relapsing forms of MS. We're not great at preventing it and we're really we're getting closer but we're not great at reversing it but this is what we really actually want um, for people with progressive MS. 
We also need to improve and speed up clinical trials for people with progressive MS. So the way that clinical trials are done, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, um, has been very much fashioned around um, endpoints and um, disease courses of people with relapsing forms of the disease, and it's just not appropriate um, for people with progressive MS. So we actually had to really have a proper think about how clinical trials were done in progressive MS and how they could be improved and accelerated. And then the third point, which is part of that second part of the vision, is how can we help improve wellbeing for people that are living with progressive MS right now while we get on with trying to figure out how we're going to treat them. So understand end progression, reverse progression. Um, this was kind of a mixture of the activities that we do as part of the Alliance or a mixture of two main components. The first is large global collaborations and the second is funding of fundamental research at a bench top level. So we have two um, large collaborative networks for drug discovery um, in, this, in this pillar. Um, as I've said, we were very focused on treatments. The first is one um, that is looking at developing a drug discovery platform to try and find compounds or drugs that can protect and repair the brain. And that's being led by Giovanni, Giovanni Martino from um, Milan, and but also is a global collaboration with say 20 or 30 people from around the world working with him and trying to really just get a proper pipeline going um, for uh, drugs that can protect and repair the brain. The second network in this section um, is run by Frank Quintana at um, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is the hospital uh, attached to Harvard. Um, and that one is particularly looking at the innate immune process. So we know that MS is uh, due to the um, immune system attacking the myelin or the coating of the nerve fiber within the brain and spinal cord. But in progressive MS, we really think the branch of the immune system that we call the innate immune system is at work in the brain and spinal cord. So um, this network was really looking at whether or not um, there were uh, drugs, candidates that we could determine that were particularly going to target the innate immune process. And again, this was a group of around 30 people from all around the world um, led by Frank Quintana. And you can see the money associated with this um, was massive, massive. <laughs> for us and massive for everybody, but it also, this is the beauty of alliances. You can really um, pull all your money and make great strides forward. So these two networks between them received 8 million euros in funding over four years, which is a huge amount. Um, so what did they do? So the drug discovery uh, network uh, from Montino in Milan um, actually developed a, a, a method of screening potential drugs or compounds using bioinformatics and building a model to be able to tell whether or not um, the computer basically thought that these, based on their um, characteristics, whether or not these compounds would be able to protect the nerve cells or the nerve fibres and promote myelin repair. Um, so he built this model and then he screened a very large number of compounds um, and found some that the, uh, the computer said yes to. And the second stage was to screen those compounds in a dish in the laboratory, so grow some cells in a dish and see whether or not those compounds were working um, in order to repair the myelin, um, promote myelin repair on the nerve fibres or in the myelin-forming cells that Thomas mentioned. Um, and then the third stage was if they passed the, the Petri dish test that whether or not they had therapeutic potential um, in laboratory models of progressive MS. Um, and this has gone incredibly well. Um, it's been going for um, a number of years now um, and a tiny bit slowed down by COVID, but um, they have identified um, a number of candidates that are looking very promising um, and they are currently being assessed by an independent body to see their potential and value to being rolled further along the pipeline. So the other one that I mentioned about the innate immunity, so the, the immune cells within the brain and spinal cord by Frank Quintana, um, 
particularly was interested in um, some candidate drugs. So he'd already identified some candidate drugs that he thought were working on innate immunity. Um, and he evaluated um, that activity of those candidate drugs on the innate immune system in experimental models of progressive MS. And then particularly looked at how it seemed that those drugs were working um, and exerting their beneficial effect. Because if we know, if we can determine how the drugs are working, then we can also have a look around for other, com other compounds or other candidates that might also work in the same pathway or have the same target um, and expand the repertoire that way. So once he had defined that, um, he went on to identify additional candidates um, that also we thought would work on the innate immune system in progressive MS. Um, and this has been very successful also. Um, and we're also getting his targets identified now as part of an independent um, assessment process uh, within the Alliance. So I mentioned at the beginning, we had the two big network awards, which was the millions of dollars, but we also really wanted to address this idea that as a, as a group of scientists and doctors and clinicians and neurologists, we don't know enough about progression. Um, we certainly don't know enough to be able to reverse it. So um, there was another prong to this priority, and this was small grants of 75,000 euros over one year, but specifically for high risk projects that aim to shift the field. So none of this, I've done step one and I kind of want to do step two. It had to be something that was truly innovative and different and would give you a little bit of money and give you a year and see what happened because we just needed to start looking everywhere in order to kind of crack the nut of what is happening with progression. And it's one of the first things we did. You can see um, 22 awards um, totaling 1.6 million euros in 2014, so right at the very start of the Alliance. And two of those uh, awards led onto the collaborative networks that I've just discussed. Um, one of the people that received that award was uh, at the time Dr. Stephen Petrashwitz um, at the University of Melbourne, and he's looking particularly at um, a pathway that he thinks will be able to. Um, enhance myelin repair in the brain and spinal cord or rather uh, block the blocker of um, stopping myelin repair, double negative, but um, just a really exciting piece of work that he has carried on into the future and is still working in that space very productively. And just recently, just earlier this year, we did our second round, um, particularly looking at mechanisms again, because we've, we know some things that we still don't know nearly enough. Um, so 2021, 19 awards totaling 1.25 million. Um, two Australian researchers were successful, which is very exciting. So Dr. Jessica Fletcher, who's now at the Menzies um, at the University of Tasmania is looking at a completely novel method for myelin repair. And it's extremely exciting. And also Professor Jeanette Lechner-Scott, who is at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales, is looking at epigenetics, um, which is kind of the the interface between genetics and environmental factors um, and particularly whether or not that can explain why some people progress and other people don't or the speed at which people progress and whether or not that in itself will give us uh, an understanding of the underlying mechanisms of progression. So the second pillar that I mentioned um, was simply to improve and speed up clinical trials. So um, Thomas spoke about a lot of um, wonderful, expensive, long clinical trials in his talk. Um, they can take up to five years to complete. Um, they take at least two. And people with progressive forms of MS don't have that amount of time to waste. We need to accelerate the way that we do clinical trials in progressive MS. Um, one of the big problems is we don't have biomarkers for progression in MS, or we, at the time we didn't have biomarkers. Biomarkers are simply ways of measuring biological molecules or measuring some sort of biological process. So we didn't have a measurement, a really good fast measurement for progression in MS, which means you have to just wait and you have to do EDSS scores such as Thomas described 
and it takes time. So all during that time, the clinical trials are going on and on and on, um, and it's just it's not fast enough for people living with progressive MS. Um, and then the second part was, well, the other thing we need to think about is whether or not we need to change the framework of how our clinical trials are performed. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we tackled that. We did that in a few ways. So the first way um, that we did that was through our third global collaborative network. And this was particularly looking for biomarkers around imaging, so ways to measure um, biological processes around imaging. And so this is Doug Arnold, and he's at McGill in uh, Canada. And what he did um, or, and continues to do, um, I love this project, he uses artificial intelligence to improve and speed up the reading of MRIs, magnetic resonance images, um, and see whether or not we can use that um, to find digital biomarkers to predict and recognise progression of MS in the brain and the spinal cord. So he was also awarded a huge chunk of money to do this, 4 million euros over four years. Um, and they have been amassing the MRI data and scans from all of the clinical trials that have ever happened in progressive MS. And this is why it's beautiful that we have the industry forum alongside us to provide that kind of information. And he's currently working on um, 13,500 subjects, so participants, people living with progressive MS that were part of the clinical trials, and between them, 72,000 MRI scans. So that's a lot of data um, for the artificial intelligence to learn what it's looking for and then see if it can predict and recognise progression in the brain. So this has um, been truly amazing um, and just such a great use of technology, I think, um, and it has, we have identified, or they have identified, I didn't do anything, um, to new ways to track progression, and we're now looking at making this into a resource to assist with clinical trials in progressive MS in the future, but also potentially for um, use in routine clinical practice. Um, the second biomarker that we wanted to look at was blood biomarkers. Um, so this is, this is a blood test. So is there a blood test that we could possibly do to track progression in MS. Um, and there has been one that's been bouncing around for a while. It's called neurofilament light chain or NFL. And basically neurofilament light chain is a structural protein of the, uh, the nerve fiber in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and as the nerve fiber breaks down, which it does do um, during uh, progressive MS and other neurodegenerative diseases actually, it turns up in the blood. Um, so if you've got NFL in the blood, then um, it's that damage is probably happening in the brain. And so what we really wanted to look at at the time, this seemed like the best possible candidate for a blood test to um, track progression in MS. And we wanted it to do two things. One, to see whether or not we could predict the future course of the disease, so whether or not someone was going to progress um, slowly or quickly. And then two, to indicate during a clinical trial whether or not a treatment is working. So you can imagine if you are a participant in a clinical trial and then you have a series of blood tests where we measure um, the levels of NFL in the blood and we can potentially tell whether or not that's getting worse or getting better or staying the same, um, we could potentially shorten the clinical trial because we can track it better. So um, what we've done so far with this is develop a set of recommendations because there are quite a few different um, technical ways of dealing with NFL at a laboratory level. So a set of recommendations about how we should handle it and the types of tests that we'd like to do um, and what would be useful for a clinical trial um, and what wouldn't be. And then again, which I also another amazing strength of the Alliance and the Industry Forum, um, We've been working with the regulatory bodies in the US and in Europe um, to talk to them about using neurofilament light chain in clinical trials as a biomarker. So we can jump up and down as scientists or as neurologists and say that we think it's fantastic, but if the regulator who is going to approve the medication in a particular country or jurisdiction will only accept an EDSS score then there's no point to this. So what we've been doing is working with them to say, if we can show you that this is a good biomarker for progression, will you start using it as a potential endpoint alongside everything else, but as a potential endpoint 
within clinical trials because it means we can shorten the time frame of clinical trials. And then the changing of the frame, framework. So I've mentioned a few, a few times that we just really needed the clinical trial design for progressive MS to change. Clinical trials traditionally were designed for relapsing forms of MS, which is absolutely um, appropriate because those were the drugs that we were testing at the time, but we need to develop a new way to effectively test for new treatments and we need to do it faster. So there's a number of ways that we've been trying to develop as part of the Alliance um, to do this. And one of them is to run compounds in parallel within a clinical trial. So normally in a clinical trial, um, in a traditional clinical trial, you would have a drug that was either up against placebo, which is a dummy tablet or injection, or up against one other um, known therapy. But if we ran a number of compounds alongside each other and then one seemed to be working, we could switch people to the one that seemed to be working. And if one wasn't working, they could drop away and we could move to what we call an adaptive clinical trial design. So we've been trying to think about ways to make clinical trials more effective and more efficient. Um, and the other piece that we really wanted to do was um, this idea of experimental medicine, which I've got in quotes there, which is to include biological tracking and testing during the trial. So during a traditional clinical trial, you're mostly just testing to see if the endpoints have changed for people, but you're not necessarily testing how the drug is working, things at a, at a molecular level. Um, and up until the point of the clinical trial, a lot of the work has always been done in experimental models. And then when we get to people, we don't necessarily do a huge amount of work in this space. We just try to figure out if it's working or not. So if we did this experimental medicine that ran alongside, like a couple of extra blood tests, say, alongside your clinical trial, then we can learn more about what works and what doesn't or why it's working or why it's not working in people with progressive MS. And then even if the trial does fail and we have underwhelming results, we'll know more about why, um, hopefully, why it may have been effective or ineffective and we can take that information into the next trial. Um, the other thing that we really wanted to push um, as the Alliance was to include more diversity of participants in clinical trials. So um, in particular, um, age is a massive issue for clinical trial participation. The cutoffs um, are not helpful for people with progressive MS, so um, include more of an age range and then also um, just the widen the inclusion criteria with respect to EDSS. So a lot of people are potentially just not even eligible to get into clinical trials because that's traditionally um, the group that people have targeted. Um, so talking to the industry forum and talking to um, scientists about what would be useful um, as inclusion criteria for clinical trials and trying to widen that out. And finally, and really um, I should put this at the top because it's the most important thing, but to include people with progressive MS in the actual clinical trial design. So quite often, it's getting better, but definitely in 2014, the participants themselves, the people with progressive MS that were going to be part of the trial were not consulted on the design. So the design could be incredibly onerous, um, impossible for people to keep to, and then you have a huge attrition rate um, and you, you're not able to keep a clinical trial going or it's just not helpful for people or it's just it's too much um, or it's measuring things that are not necessarily important to people with progressive MS. So trying to incorporate that at the start of the clinical trial so that we're measuring meaningful outcomes for people with MS but also designing trials that people are uh, want to and are capable of being part of. Okay, and the third prong um, is to improve wellbeing. So I mentioned the second part of our mission is to try and fix as much as we can for people living with progressive MS right now, where we try to get as many treatments on the go as possible. So we want to improve quality of life through better symptom management. Obviously, there is a unbelievably large array of symptoms of MS. Um, and so we looked to a number of surveys that have been done by um, MS organisations, including one that was done in 2016 by MS Research Australia, which I've just repeated actually in 2021, to look at which symptoms were particularly bothersome and which symptoms um, people with progressive MS really wanted to 
have better treatment for, essentially. Um, and you can see the four that came up um, worldwide there. So fatigue, we know um, one of the most common symptoms of MS across the whole um, spectrum of diseases. Impairment of mobility in particular, uh, particularly upper limb function. Pain is a huge one and cognitive impairment by which we mean difficulty with thinking and memory and processing. So what we wanna do with these is really push the research forward um, and push forward the findings that we already have in these areas, um, but particularly in order to be able to measure um, each of these uh, symptoms well, because at the moment we, we have scales, but they can be improved, but ultimately to get better treatments and then translate them into the use in clinics, in clinical care for people with MS, and then make sure that the improvements are sustained and meaningful for people trying to live with progressive MS. Um, so the next steps, um, so we've got um, lots of things on the go. Um, we're aiming to expand the findings of the networks with respect to drug, drug discovery that I mentioned early on, and also um, the imaging biomarkers in terms of um, turning it into a resource and trying to make that um, a translate translatable outcome of the Alliance. Um, we're getting a lot of momentum now on improvements to clinical trials for progressive MS and we're talking to our industry partners about ways that we can change the clinical trials and I mentioned talking to the regulators about their um, impression of what an endpoint should be and how we can measure them and make sure that we're all on the same page and then um, fund the research gaps for wellbeing that I just mentioned, particularly in those symptom areas so that we can improve quality of life for people with progressive MS right now. Okay, so um, I just wanted to pop this up um, at the end. So if you wanna learn more, there is a um, International Progressive MS Alliance website that has a huge amount of information and progress reports um, and lots of great videos and um, interesting bits and pieces that the, Pro the Progressive Alliance is up to if you wanted to learn more about that. Um, MS Research Australia has a lot of information about how we're involved um, on this side of the planet within the uh, Progressive Alliance and MS Australia as well. We're just in the process of merging those two websites. I've popped them both up, but we do have a lot of information about um, how we're involved in the Alliance if you're interested. So please um, pop along to those websites and have a read. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. An impressive review on the coordinated attack on the problem of progression. I, I see it's a very exciting example of international collaboration and I think offers real hope that we'll make progress within a reasonable time in an area that has been a, a bit of a wasteland uh, as far as results go. Um, Amanda, how are we going to do questions? All right, so I'm happy to ask um, the ones that have been typed in. If right. anyone would like to ask a question verbally, just uh, raise your hand and I can um, uh, open you up to be able to speak and ask your question verbally. So the questions that we've received to date, um, first one, Thomas, um, that you mentioned wearable sensors as a way to track disability. Can you recommend any? It's really a very early days uh, of research. Uh, there are a number of uh, different apps. Um, basically, pretty much every every company, every industry entity ha is developing their own app. Uh, there are also some uh, investigator initiated apps. I know that the Swiss group around the Swiss uh, and this registry are developing their own app. Um, there are a couple of active initiatives in North America around the um, Cleveland Clinic. So I know that I'm not giving concrete answers, uh, but that is because I can't recommend. I can't, you know, recommend particular one. Uh, each of them is uh, slightly different. Uses slightly different set of instruments. One has to be mindful that these sets of instruments are largely non-validated. Um, there is research on them going on there, so still need to be validated against the standardized tools that we use in clinical practice. Probably one functionality that is worth exploring and that doesn't require validation is the record taking when you want to keep track of your own progress of your own symptoms you know 
make a note about where you have experienced something that you would like to discuss with your doctor or a question that you want to jot down and bring them down to a consultation. Thank you. And um, we've got a question. Uh, can there be progression even though nothing is shown as having changed on an MRI? A very good question. This is something that I have touched upon uh, in part of the talk about the so-called subclinical latent progression. Um, and Julia has also mentioned that in, in her talk. I, I think I think we're very much aligned there. We, we believe that this is a very important un, uh, unmet need in terms of the diagnostics for the reason that I mentioned before, that by the time that a clinician, whether that is a neurologist or radiologist, or the person living with them has realizes that they have accrued disability by the time it's usually too late with the drugs that we currently have at our disposal to reverse the damage that has already occurred. Hopefully in the future, the messaging will be different, but at the moment we should really be focusing on identifying those early. I have some good news in that space. We have developed a project that, that is looking at exploring a, a, a suite of potential biomarkers, including neurofilament light chain, which is a soluble biomarker that can be detected from blood, volumetric MRI, thorough comprehensive um, assessment of cognitive state over time, and several other markers that we're actually focusing on, and I will not bore you with the long list, it's about 10 or 15 markers. But importantly, and that, that important overlay has so far been largely neglected in the studies, uh, advanced analytics of these markers. And I'm not talking about machine learning. I'm talking about hypothesis-driven analytics that will enable us to develop tools that are accessible tools and to, to clinicians and routine practice. And hopefully this will be a practice changing step whereby based on the results that we will achieve through this project over the next two, three to five years, your clinician will be able to run a set of tests routinely at every appointment and tell you what is your degree of the subclinical progression and whether an, an action needs to take place. So this is a project that is currently partially funded by the Neuroscience Foundation, the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and uh, we're very excited to hopefully launch it early next year. Um, we've got a question here that it's not directly related to uh, progressive MS, but um, someone may be able to answer this. Um, is it okay to have both COVID injections if you have MS and you have primary biliary cirrhosis of the liver? So obviously it's not directly related to what we're talking about, but um, if anyone has any recommendations there. It sounds like a very much sort of very personal question about someone's individual situation with MS and their particular, um, the particular concern. To be frank, I'd like to stay away from this type of questions at the moment. Uh, I think my limitation here is I really don't know the full story. I don't know all the, uh, concomitant medication, the other comorbid diseases, uh, and I wouldn't want to give any false yeah. or wrong recommendations. Yeah. And I think that um, that person just needs to talk to their neurologist and their um, GP for that individual recommendation. Um, the next question we have is, I found um, gyrogonics uh, hugely beneficial in maintaining strength and reducing progression. Is there any um, uh, information and development in that area? So gyrogonics as in the uh, movement, movement patterns that are encouraged by a certain type of exercise, I understand it correctly, I think yoga and gymnastics, dance and, and so on. Um, I wish I had the qualifications to, to give an informed answer on that point. Um, so I would have to defer to a colleague here who is an expert in rehabilitation medicine there. Um, I'm just going to look. We've got another question been typed in here. One second. Um, Ernie, could you please clarify what the access in New Zealand is for DMTs for people with progressive MS with relapses? Um, Pharmac is reasonably flexible about that. That's one thing they are flexible about, not much else. Um, that they accept that anyone with relapses of the sort that we associate with acute inflammation can have access to treatment under their rules, whether or not they have underlying progression. So we in fact have a number of people who started with primary progressive MS and then happen to have a relapse or two along the way and are able to have treatment. So I, I, we're reasonably well off. The problem we have is getting treatment very early for 
uh, people after a first attack. That remains a problem for us, but I think we're making progress on that. And I, I think Thomas raised an important point, this issue that early treatment and his, his group with using MS base has uh, produced very important work, I think, in showing that we can perhaps help low-grade progression as well as preventing relapses by starting treatment early. And I guess Thomas, I, I, perhaps he doesn't have the data whether starting, say, within the first two years rather than the first five years might be a good thing. Sure, do you have the data? Uh, I'm pleased to say. Um, we did publish recently a paper in Lancet Neurology where we have looked at people who um, in the first 10 years of the life with MS required treatment with what we dare term the high efficacy therapies. And for practical reasons, we've looked in, uh, we, we have uh, used um, so called Roman therapies, rituximab, ocrelizumab, mitoxantrin, alimentizumab, and natalizumab. Uh, so, all these people were exposed to these therapies at some stage uh, during early life with MS. Uh, the main difference between the groups that we compared was a separation by the initiation of therapy. The, the early group started treatment between year zero to two from the first symptom, and the late group started the uh, therapy between year four to six from the first MS symptom. Then we looked at the disability outcomes between years six to 10, so after people have started the therapies, and after um, harmonizing the two groups and matching them on the clinical and demographic features. And what we have seen that those who started the high efficacy treatments earlier uh, saved themselves up to one EDSS step and that difference of one, on average one EDSS step in outcomes was sustained throughout the five years of follow-up between his six and 10. So really a clinically meaningful difference in terms of the preventing disability. And we've just had a couple more come through as well now. Um, can you comment on the role of exercise in slowing progression? Yep. So, I mean, intuitively, the, the clinical uh, the clinical intuitive response is always absolutely yes. And uh, many of us strongly encourage uh, particular people with progressive MS phenotypes to engage in exercise as much as possible. Um, uh, from the point of view of preserving the the musculoskeletal health, of course, from the point of view of, of uh, improving cardiovascular health and, minimi and, and keeping BMI within within um, reasonable you know, reasonable range. Uh, uh, in terms of the effect of exercise on the neuroplasticity and the uh, neural function, that is something that is an area of, um, of very active research. There are some emerging results, first, really only first hints that suggest that there is potentially some improvement at the, the CNS, central nervous system level. But for that particular retro, what we call retrograde mechanism of action of exercise, we still need more evidence. But overall messaging is absolutely, it's a, it's a beneficial thing to do. Great. Um, I know we're at time, but we've just got a couple more questions. If that's okay. Um, I'm not sure when does your relapsing MS become secondary progression? What is the criteria for that? Uh, so um, the uh, clinical diagnostic criteria really revolve, revolve around a, the phrase uh, the relentless progression of ir ir irreversible disability that is independent from relapses. Um, that is a vague definition, but I think that it, it will reflect the current, current clinical practice. I have listed that one definition, which is more um, anchored in numbers around you know, the, the grade of EDS is worsening, the time of which it need, needs to be confirmed, and so on and so on. That is a very procedural definition. Uh, I would encourage use of that definition in clinical practice. We more use it more for research for as an outcome or for selection of patients. But that former definition is something that your neurologist would be using. Great. Um, and for people who are, um, for example, JCD positive on Tysabri and maybe don't tolerate Ocrevus, um, what options are there coming up in the future uh, treatment wise? Are there, is there anything on the radar that is of particular note? Um, yeah, so there are um, several several therapies that are either at the early stage of the drug development or they are now will become available hopefully soon. Uh, there are other B-cell depleting therapies apart from opalizumab, such as ofatumumab, which is an injectable therapy. The mechanism of action is similar, 
So in terms of the tolerance issues, uh, it depends really on how the intolerance of the medication is mediated, whether it is mediated through immune depletion, in which case ofatimumab would have the same uh, tolerance issues as ocrelizumab, or whether it is uh, mediated through a autoimmune response or allergic response towards the molecule, in which case ofatimumab may be an option if ocrelizumab uh, triggers allergic reactions in an individual. But another molecule or set of molecules that is using different mechanism of action affecting can mainly B cells, but also innate immunity and T cells to a certain extent is uh, extent are so-called BTK inhibitors or Burton kinase inhibitors. Um, these are inhibitors they were piloted in both relapsing and progressive MS phenotypes. Um, a couple of them are now going through phase two trials. So hopefully, and, and, the, and the, we are on the brink of uh, th phase three trials in both relapsing MS and we have some access to progressive MS using BTK inhibitors in, uh, in Australia. Um, so hopefully we are not that far from the introduction to clinical practice. Thank Perhaps you. I should in interject a note from the New Zealand point of view. Thomas may not be aware that we don't have cladribine or saponamod approved here yet, uh, but potentially if those uh, are approved, they would be a step forward for us, some extra options that are already available in Australia. Fantastic. Yeah. And at MS New Zealand, we're working on that, hopefully trying to get those funded. Um, uh, or helping to get those funded anyway. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you. There's been some great uh, comments coming through um, from everyone who's been enjoying the sessions, uh, obviously enjoying the expertise that's coming through, being able to learn and listen. Um, and just a really great comment. Thank you from Kelly. Um, Julia, thank you. I like the vision that while people with MS are participating in trials, they're being consulted in the research trial. Let's help the MS community now while we do research. Let's give back to the MS. Yeah, so I just thought that was a nice one to share. And I'll hand back over to you, Ernie. Right, well, I'll finish up. And uh, on behalf of the NZMS Research Trust, uh, I thank our speakers, absolutely first-class talks. I think the feedback is reflecting that. And uh, as Kiwis, we really do appreciate, in our lockdown state, I guess you're a bit locked down too, we do appreciate uh, uh, the effort you Australians have made to come and uh, update us on what really what is quite an exciting time in a, in a very difficult area of MS. So thank you, Julia and Thomas, very much. And thank, thank you, everyone. Good evening. It was evening. a pleasure. Good evening thank from the land so of uh, lockdowns and earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> You're joining Christchurch. <laughs> <laughs>